Okay, so um, I'll just put up the next slide. Just so um, when Justin asked us to do these talks, we were thinking mainly with the dip farm in mind. So I had a trawl through the dip farm curriculum. I'll keep my camera off if you don't mind, just because the the internet here is a little bit tricky. Um, but hopefully just to make this an interactive discussion covering these points. And I had a chat with Jeff Healy yesterday just about the various different requirements and whether he had any kind of, whether he felt I was on the right kind of line of what the dip farm were after. Um, so essentially, um, I've summarised these points here into, um, into the next slide. So essentially looking at, at the equipment and processes and the techniques used to manage all the various different physical effects that occur during transfer, um, including turbulent vibration, G-forces, et cetera. Um, when you might consider a carbon altitude restriction, some of the clinical conditions that need specific management regarded to all those physical um, principles of transfer, um, and then specifically just thinking about trapped gas and altitude. Um, so we're going to cover just a, a brief overview of the gas laws, um, the effect of oxygen, and then I've divided those different things up and just, just to have a bit of a think about each one of those in turn, and then try to make those relevant to both the patient, ourselves as a team, and the equipment that we carry. So starting with the gas laws, the most I think the most relevant to us is that volume is inversely, inversely proportional to pressure. So as we go up in, in altitude, we reduce pressure and therefore increase volume. Um, that's obviously relevant to a few different things. Um, I think probably the most common one that we would encounter in a trauma setting is pneumothorax, um, but also need to bear in mind in in other conditions such as bowel obstruction or for example if you've had recent eye or ENT surgery or trauma where you might have very small bubbles of gas which aren't causing a problem at the moment but have the potential to do. Uh, certainly for long distance or longer distance transfers using fixed wing you'd want to check your um, ET cuff pressures, think about your equipment. You've got the option, ventilators can either be turbine or gas driven with pros and cons of both um, obviously, if it's a gas-driven ventilator, then you need a supply of pressurised gas in order for that ventilator to work. So the advantage of a turbine-driven ventilator is that you don't necessarily need um, an oxygen supply to drive it, although you do need a power supply. Um, so thinking about the ventilators that we use, how we charge them, and obviously we've got a really good setup at Sydney Hems where the ventilator can be plugged into the helicopter, the ventilator is charging when the vehicles are driving, so you're charging often to and from a fixed wing job, for example. Um, but those have all undergone extensive airworthiness testing. Um, and all of those things have been thought about in advance so that we don't, while we think about them on the job, we don't um, worry about them being so unreliable that it's kind of our top concern constantly. But obviously for very long jobs or international retrievals, you know, the care flight that you guys do, um, you just need to bear in mind that, you know, you need an adequate gas supply and adequate power supply. It does did also mention in some of the literature that the accuracy of the tidal volume and therefore minute volume calculations um, varies between ventilators once they're exposed to altitude. And again, I'm sure that was a consideration in, in choosing the Hamilton. And then from a, um, as Anil's going to talk about all the human factor stuff, we've then from a, from a team based point of view, we've got the, the fact that all of those physical conditions of vibration, etc, are all fatiguing. And so that increases the fatigue um, levels of the crew, um, both medical and non-medical, and also has an influence in terms of whether you're fit to fly. So, for example, if you have a problem, an inner ear problem, and you can't e uh, equilibrate your ears, then it may be that even though you feel well, that you're not actually fit to fly and fit to work. Um, obviously, you couldn't get through a, as an anaesthetist, couldn't get possibly get through a presentation without the alveolar gas equation. Um, I think. The main takeaway from this is that at um, you know at altitude, the hum the standard vapor pressure of water doesn't change, and so that then becomes a much bigger proportion of the um, of the amount of gas that is existing in the alveoli. And so it reduces your inspired oxygen from around 21%. So if you get up to 200 meters, 
um, you're looking at 15 percent. So it really doesn't it doesn't take a massive height. So 200 meters is about six and a half thousand feet um, and your patient's breathing a hypoxic mixture. Um, and we, it wouldn't be uncommon. So certainly going from Marimbula, I was chatting to our pilot today, going from Marimbula to Canberra, you'd be at 7,000 feet to do that. So that's not an uncommon height for, for our helicopters. Going the Blue Mountains are about 4,000 feet. So flying over the Blue Mountains from Sydney, you'd be about 5,000. So you're obviously going to be somewhere between um, 20 and 15%. And the other thing that is worth bearing in mind um, is that the change in pressure is greater at the, the greatest change in pressure is at the lowest height. So if you've got um, a patient who you're worried has, has, you know, has had a diving incident and, you know, I think Nat Cruitt went to a patient where they were diving, there'd been a problem with the, there was a couple of people diving, there'd been a problem with one of the cylinders and in the panic, um, they'd, uh, the injured person had surfaced rapidly and then gone into a cardiac arrest. And when she placed the central line as part of the recess, um, there was obvious air in the bloodstream, obvious foam, foamy blood. Um, and so if she had managed to get that person back, then you would have wanted a significant altitude restriction, even for a helicopter. So um, the, the lowest height they can fly at is 200 meters um, off the coast if it's good weather and good visibility. Uh, most of the pilots would feel much more comfortable at 500, uh, sorry, at feet, 200 feet or 500 and 500 feet. So you can certainly make a massive difference to uh, a patient like that by by bearing that in mind and choosing a route, um, which may involve, you know, a slightly longer flight, for example, um, if you get to a hospital that you where you don't have to fly over a mountain range or over terrain. Um, so one, a couple of things on the list is... is on the dip form is gravity and turbulence, which, um, so gravity is measured in Newtons. It's, it's, it's equal to, not, uh, the effect on our bodies and gravity, the Earth's gravity at sea level is 9.81 Newtons, which equates to one G. And it sounds obvious, but all of our physiology is optimized for that. So in terms of your, um, your lung, your lungs and ventilating and BQ match, your cardiovascular system, um, the blood supply to your brain, it's all optimized for 1G. So obviously the more extreme you get away from 1G, then the more extreme that effect is on the body. Looking at a loss of consciousness at a loss of consciousness at about 5G. Um, weight is gravity times mass, and that's relevant because if you have a 90 kilo patient and all of a sudden you're you you you're experiencing 2G, that that patient is now double the weight. And so they're over, all of a sudden, it, now you've now got a patient that's over, you know, over 160 kilos. Um, so they started off as a normal, an 80 kilo patient, and you've now doubled the, the weight of that patient in terms of if they're not secured and they start moving around the cabin. And so obviously, again, with our bridges, we've, everything is secured and everything is strapped out. Um, and the second thing that's really relevant to gravity and turbulence would be aircraft incidents in terms of crashing. And so this is from the ABC of Retrieval Medicine, talking about an acronym of crashworthiness. Again, I don't think necessarily that the specifics of this particular algorithm would, would ever come up in the exam. Um, it didn't seem that familiar to Jeff, but I think it's just a way of if you were asked about the, you know, the relevant factors, um, that it's it's an easy acronym to remember just to have to hand in terms of um, you know if, if a question comes up so I, that's why I've left this slightly wordy slide but I've left this copied directly from the ABC just as, as a reference so you're thinking about the, the container i.e the structure of the aircraft um, and and obviously that is it, preventing penetration of external objects to a degree the four point harness um, or five point harness for the pilot uh, in terms of keeping the patient, keeping you, the staff and or any sitting patients in their seat. Energy attenuation, so crumple zones and um, for example, the skids and the seat we actually sit in reduce the amount of force delivered um, to the personnel within the aircraft in the event of a crash. 
we've all obviously done here it so we probably escape would be top of the list um and the ability to get out of the aircraft in an accident and then post crash factors such as you know the life jackets that are in uh, that we wear and the extra packs we take for the patients the survival packs um fire extinguishers etc cetera, etc cetera. So um, the effect of vibration, so we experience vibration in, in all forms of transport, uh, but vibration causes muscle fatigue, more so at specific frequencies. But again, um, I haven't included those only because Jeff didn't think that was relevant at all to remember this, all the different specifics. It, causes, it also causes vasoconstriction, which then causes decreased sweating. So that combination of increased work from the muscles to, to maintain posture, coupled with vasoconstriction, limits the ability to thermoregulate. So particularly relevant in, in very hot climates, like we sometimes see here in Australia, um, that you, you need to bear in mind that the team will fatigue more easily. It can also cause arrhythmias, disrupt clot formation, and, cause, and the lower hertz can cause motion sickness. It's worth bearing in mind um, that if you've got a patient prone to that, you'd give a prophylactic antiemetic. It sounds obvious, but in a, in a rotary wing aircraft, the, the rotors themselves are the source of the turbulence, whereas in a fixed wing aircraft, it's turbulence that is the source of the vibration. And so obviously that could be managed with route planning, whereas the, you know, the vibration of the rotors is inherent to that individual aircraft. And it has factors built into the aircraft that minimize that, but it isn't something that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then uh, in terms of a road move, your vibration is more extreme in, when cornering. So again, if you, if you can take a highway rather than taking low side windy roads, then great. Temperature and pressure. So in terms of the patient, obviously you want to be considering monitoring the patient, particularly over much longer distances. Um, I mean, we obviously can control the temperature and pressure in our aircraft really well. Uh, we did have quite a few issues with that, getting um, Aeromed online for one of the new RAF aircraft because uh, the, issue, the issue was that all the heaters were at the front and the back of the plane was so cold um, that people were in, you know, fully conscious people were in sleeping bags and needing to walk around the aircraft to stay warm while the people at the front were, you know, sitting in shirts and shorts trying to cool down. And so it was so extreme that they ended up um, adapting the aircraft and there's and we can still only put patients within a certain range and that's a combination of the temperature factors and also the vibration that exists at various different points of the aircraft depending on the engines um, so it's just worth bearing in mind that like I said we've got an amazing setup but th that isn't true across the board for Aeromed um, and th then obviously amongst the many other problems with a sudden cath sudden cabin depressurization you'll get a rapid drop in temperature at 8,000 feet you're looking at um sorry at 8,000 meters you're looking at a temperature of about about minus 50. and then this definitely won't come up in the exam but i thought it was really interesting um that at 63,000 feet there's um there's a line discovered by a previous air force the u.s air force general so named after him as armstrong's line which is that once the pressure drops to 6.3 kilopascals the boiling point of water is body temperature. So the human body's sweat and uh, lung surfactant boils off. Um, and so this is actually how the, the crew of the Space Shuttle Columbia died um, because the, when, they, when they were exposed to that pressure breach in the hull, they didn't have their pressure, pressurized suits on. They, didn't, they had them on, but they didn't have them closed. So they didn't have their gloves on. They didn't have their visors down. And so at that at that pressure, uh, people become impossible to oxygenate unless you can repressurize. Uh, G-forces again. So uh, this is probably a bit more detail that we need. So they talk about X, Y, and Z, and there's a nice little mnemonic here, which where your thumb becomes if you hold your right hand out in front of you, then your thumb becomes Z, your index finger is X, and your middle finger is Y. Um, which is a good mnemonic but um again i showed this to jeff and he didn't feel like memorizing the specifics of that was relevant it was more about the effects of g in general on the human body um, and the other thing that we talked about is that essentially they talk about gz in terms of the longitudinal axis of the 
of the human body. So if if it does happen to come up, then um, GZ is the longitudinal axis of the person, i.e. the G, my understanding is, I'm ha and I'm happy to be talked on about this, but asking the pilot yesterday that it's, it's relevant to the body rather than relevant to the aircraft. So GZ is the longitudinal axis of the human body. So um, obviously you experience a positive G as an increase in gravitational force and a negative the G decrease. So when at takeoff, for example, you experience positive G, the sensation is that you're being pushed back into the seat. And so it's felt, felt as, a, as an almost like an increase in, well, it is an increase in weight. Whereas um, you might experience minus GZ is, um, is something called auto rotation. So it's one of the ways in which the a helicopter, it's one of the emergencies that they train for. But essentially, under auto rotation, if the engines failed or stalled, the blades continue to rotate, but you obviously then your your acceleration changes rapidly, and so you end up feeling that as a sensation of weightlessness as the aircraft starts to fall. So under um, high sustained negative vertical g-force, so you then get an increased venous return which causes a reflex brady. But then because you get that increased venous return and that increased um, blood pressure causing the bradycardia, the blood that increased blood pressure then causes peripheral vasodilation to, to even all of that out. And the problem is that you can end up with pooling in the central circulation and that can cause a raised intracranial pressure. And it also causes VQ mismatch. So this is what, you, so, to, to oversimplify, you end up with too much blood in the head and at the top of the lungs, but the lungs are also more difficult to ventilate at the top because of the increased pressure from the diaphragm and so and the abdominal contents. So you then end up with a VQ mismatch. And then positive G is obviously the other way around. You get blood pooling into the feet, um, which reduces your venous return. And like I said earlier, at 5G, you, you don't actually get any blood flow to the brain, so you, you lose consciousness. Um, after a, about six seconds of exposure to, to positive G, high positive G, you'll get an increase in heart rate, contracted peripheral vasoconstriction as all your carotid baroreceptors kick in and start to compensate for that. And again, you get a VQ mismatch in the opposite direction, which is that the abdominal viscera and the diaphragm are pulled down, which then means that you get better um, oxygenation of the top of the lungs and perfusion of the base of the lungs. So again, an equal and opposite VQ mismatch. Um, so acceleration of the range of change of velocity measured in meters per second squared. Um, and uh, I've just included the, a couple of bits of the physics here. So um, Newton's laws, for every action, there is an equal and positive reaction. Um, and so the reactive force during acceleration is G. And as I've already said, it's tolerated least well when applied to the vertical axis, as we've already discussed. And then again, this is just um, from the ABC of retrieval medicine, factors that predict injury in short dur duration of acceleration. So these are accelerations that are, are normally unplanned, they're either caused by unexpected turbulence or an aircraft malfunction. So uh, as makes complete sense, the greater the change and the longer the change is for, the higher the incidence of injury. The, if it's a rapid onset of either acceleration or de deceleration, if it's directed along the G GZ axis, and depending on the site of application, so I, if you've got if you if you're seated in a seat and you're forced down into that seat, then all of that surface area is spread out. Um, the pressure is spread out across that surface area. So then you've got a greater protection from injury. So cabin altitude restrictions, as we've as already mentioned, you may want to think about with a patient, so for example, the risk of the bends or a decompression sickness. Um, standard aeromedical cabin altitude is around eight, 10,000 feet. If you ask for a, a cabin altitude restriction, you'll probably get four to 6,000 feet. That's on a longer range flight. Um, obviously, we can't pressurise the helicopters. And just to kind of put that in perspective, um, we would commonly fly at those kind of heights. That six to four to 6,000 feet is, um, is quite normal. 
and um, particularly as you, if you need to go over the Blue Mountains. So indications include trapped gas, severe pulmonary disease, and decompression sickness. Um, the the potential disadvantages. So it, it's believed that because you uh, potentially like to have more weather, that you're at risk of more turbulence. There's a limit to every aircraft will have a limit in terms of the differential between the internal and external pressure. So in order to fly, in order to pressurize a cabin, often they have to fly lower in order to be able to reach a, a, a significant cabin altitude restriction. And that then puts you more at risk of operational terrain in terms of mountains and um, uh, essentially mountains. Um, and because you're then flying lower through thicker air, that will increase your flight duration and fuel consumption. Uh, I had a little bit of a look. There was a, an interesting paper pu published about um, air medical evacuations from Afghanistan to Landstuhl, which was the American military base in the south of Germany that they used um, as, when, during the during Herrick, during the Afghan wars. And that um, they noticed that patients who were flown with a cabin altitude restriction, despite not strictly needing one. So they were flown with a cabin altitude restriction because another patient was transported at the same time that required one, did better than a similar group of patients flown without a cabin altitude restriction. So their post, like postulation that actually the, you know, the decrease in atmospheric pressure, the decrease in oxygen um, increased ICU days, increased um, post-operative complications. And those of these were a varied group of patients, but they did have about 7,000 studied the links in the um, things in the presentation. So I can I can pop that up on the WhatsApp or whatever. And I did just think that was interesting that it's probably more complicated than we realize. We're exposing a patient to a non-normal, non-adapted situation. And so there's probably more to cabin altitude restrictions, probably more use than is than is immediately obvious. Um, so it's just worth bearing in mind that, you know, while we were probably quite reluctant to ask for them, particularly internationally, uh, but it may just be worth bearing in mind that if you've got a very sick patient, even if there's no strict indication, it's worth considering. And then to wrap up, just because there was quite a few different bits and bobs in that, uh, in that presentation, there was quite a lot of team factors just to cover that obviously you need to, I mean, it would be interesting to speak to you guys and see what you do before you leave. Obviously I do a quick A to E and then like have a few different things that I tick off at the end um, before leaving. And, and you, one of them is analgesia. So you need that for the obviously duration plus any road legs. Um, so if you want to do regional, it may be worth considering putting in a nerve catheter as opposed to a single shot. Um, Entonox, again, not, not relevant at the, te at the temperature that we commonly operate at, but if, if that's used in cold temperatures, so less than minus six, it needs to be stored flat because it separates into oxygen and nitrogen. Otherwise, you'll get a, initially 100% oxygen and then 100% um, nitrogen. So just to mention in case that comes up. Um, obviously, if you've got a very long flight, again, thinking about more the, the international retrievers that the care flight do, you need to think about how you're going to maintain patient hydration and nutrition. So you may have to pack meals for patients um, and consider decompressing the stomach if you're concerned that that can impact on ventilation. You could do that before you leave. A catheter, again, if you've got a patient who isn't mobile. Uh, you can monitor temperature. It mentioned temperature, and again, I, I wasn't sure whether it was getting at in terms of ambient temperature or patient temperature. So clearly the way to get around a temperature consideration with a patient is to monitor it um, and adjust it accordingly. We've talked about some of the logistics that you think of, including the battery life, um, charging of equipment and, and its airworthiness in terms of whether or not it can be plugged in and calculating your oxygen consumption. Most people would say calculate it for the duration and then double it. Making sure that the family is aware that the patient is being moved and where they're being moved to. And again, if you've got an incredibly long journey, it may be that you plan to update the family en route. Any handover should be should have a formalised process. So 
you know, our, our carbon copies that we leave with the patient. So um, all documentation of any treatment or medications received en route is able to be handed over and documented. And th then that allows clinical governance. So, um, you know, our M&Ms and able to review those different cases. Uh, and so at the end, so this is a job, it's kind of a, a little bit of a mixture of a job that I did the other day. Um, so this was a young lad who'd come off his motorbike and um, so he'd come off his motorbike and he was he'd, about half, half past nine in the morning um, had been taken to a local ED where they'd done a lot of x-rays and they'd put on uh, a pelvic binder that was that honestly looked like a piece of underwear um, on his abdomen. It was more like a corset and um, and they'd given him some analgesia, thankfully, um, and handed over that he was uh, cardiovascularly stable. Uh, and, they'd, and they'd had the box splint that the paramedics had put on on scene still in situ. So cardiovascular and respiratory wise, he was stable, but he didn't have any lung sliding anterior on the, on the left. Um, so I was concerned that he had a small pneumothorax on that side. His abdo was completely soft on tender. We'd, we didn't get tasked until about half past, I got phoned about half past one in the afternoon. So by the time we actually got there, it was about five. <laughs> so he'd well and truly um, had a trial of life by that point. So I was confident that um, he wasn't, you know, he didn't have any significant hemorrhage, but he still, he had this leg that was obviously incredibly uncomfortable. And we had x-rays showing a, um, a distal femur and proximal tibia fracture complex fracture so um bear in mind that you know you're worried about this you're worried about this pneumothorax um what what would people be thinking about what would people do in terms of managing that justin is passing the mic literally passing the mic It's small and he's not currently compromised and you've just been given assurance that you can travel at a appropriate altitude. So I probably wouldn't touch it and have plans in place to manage it if it gets worse on the way. Have you been on a fixed wing flight here yet? No, I haven't. Yeah, on the little one. Yeah, so luckily it was left-sided and that is handy because that's the same side that we, that's the exposed side when we load to the, I don't know if it's the King Air anymore. Whatever, whatever the little plane is that we fly from Mascot. Um, so he was loaded with his left side exposed, which was helpful. Um, but I did put a, a little pneumofix in my pocket. And I kept a close eye on him. I put the little nasal um, CO2 on just so I could keep an eye on his, um, on his respiratory rate. And he TikToked the whole of off, which I reasoned was an indication of incredible cardiovascular stability. So there's probably a, I was joking, probably a Christmas BG in that somewhere. That whenever somebody's first contact their phone, definitely find it. If they're not in the middle of a deal, it's probably pretty rare. But um, interact with social media. Does anybody have any specific things that they like or like routines that they run through that they before they take off or if, they, if you do a, like a fixed ring flight that you would check specifically? Cliff's just in a nice little pre-departure checklist that he uses on uh, on WhatsApp. The WhatsApp. The, the flight nurses have an acronym that they use to cover the aviation aspects of the retrieval. Does anyone know what it is? No. Neither do I. I can't remember. No. I'm trying to look it up with my Evernote. I know I wrote a note because I thought it was really good. Um, and I've, I've forgotten it. If I find it, I'll post it. Okay. Erin was great. Like we did when we did that job, she just, as soon as I mentioned that I was worried about a new resort, she just got straight onto the pilot. And we were at 2,000 feet already. So the pilot was like, it's absolutely not a drama to maintain that the whole way back. 
um, which just was really reassuring for me because he didn't end up getting a Chester in because obviously it was small when they when he got to Westmead. Um, and you just put somebody through a, you know, a large bore chest drain, which is uncomfortable. Um, and so I was trying to weigh up the pros and cons. Um, the journey back, looking around, it did take about three hours. So it was only about an hour's flight. But by the time you're actually, we got to the airport, it was after dark. We had to do a roo, well, the ambulance had to do a roo run down the um, airstrip, which might be the, one of the most Australian things I've ever heard of. Um and then, um, so all of those little things that I just hadn't even thought about. So the pilot was like, are you going to be back after dark? Because if you are, we need somebody to drive down the runway. And so we had to get like somebody else to come out from ambulance because the guy who ran the airport was off that day and he wasn't coming out. He just refused to go. So <laughs> thankfully somebody else did that for us um, before we were able to, while we were loading the patients. Um so just all those like little considerations where you're operating in an environment you've, you know, I'd never been to that airport before um, and hadn't ever thought of that as a consideration before. So, yeah, so Erin and the pilot were great. Meg was great. Just like working as a team to think through all the different things. But I didn't hear Erin use a specific um, acronym. 